November meeting of the Stormwater Management Advisory Commission to order. Um, let's see, we have, uh, I guess, one excused absence uh, from Terrell Moore has requested an excused absence. I have a motion to excuse Mr. Moore. I move. Okay, and a second. I'll second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's see, I'll take a moment here and pause for an introduction, I guess, at this point. Um, we have, as I understand, a new SMAC member has just been confirmed. Um, and Spafford, and I guess I'll take a moment now if you'd like to introduce yourself to us. I think you're muted. Okay. About, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, I think someone muted me. Um, I'm a proud Raleigh resident. Uh, I live in the Belvedere neighborhood. Um, I'm a professor at NC State University. I teach uh, landscape design in our department. I am a trained horticulturalist and landscape architect. Um, I am uh, a co-author of this awesome book, Rain Gardening in the South. I'm also a co-author of Pollinator Gardening for the South. So um, I keep one foot firmly anchored in um, environmental concerns of design, as well as one foot firmly anchored in um, human health and well being in the built environment. So I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to help however I can. Great. Glad to have you and uh, glad to learn a little bit about your background and expertise. Uh, looks like you fit right in. Um, thank you. Um, let's see, next item of business, unless others, well, give other commissioners a chance to say hi, ask any questions, if you have any at this point. Welcome. Great. Um, our next item of business is approval of the minutes from our October meeting. Does anyone have any questions or comments on the minutes? Move for approval. All right, we have a motion for approval. A second. And a second. Second that. Okay, it's Talavera second, so all in favor. Um, and, and I'll just let you know what we're doing uh, for these online meetings is when, when it comes to votes, uh, we do a, you know, on camera hand raise it just makes it easier than a voice vote or anything like that. Um, all right, looks like the motion passes to approve those minutes. And we are on to um, a little early for public comment. Wayne, do we have any anyone who has indicated uh, they wish no, to? No, sir. I am not seeing any requests for comments in the chat. I've not received any any emails requesting a, a, a to comment. Okay. Well, if anyone uh, attending online, uh, you know, feels need to comment, uh, just please indicate in the chat and we'll uh, try to work in opportunities if there are any uh, later in the meeting as appropriate. Okay, next up, um, our commissioner comments, our commissioner of the month this month is the Reverend Jamon Taylor. Jamon, if you'd like to 
take a moment to introduce yourself and a little bit of your background. Um, we'd appreciate to hear from you. Oh, I think you're muted, Jamon. Yeah. Just looks, Ramond, it looked like you, okay. Go ahead and try it now. Okay, good. Hmm. Looks like he keeps getting remuted. Can you hear me, Evan? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, all right. All right, sorry about that little technical difficulty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jamon Taylor. Uh, this is my third year on SMAC. And I'm rector of St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, Southeast Raleigh, Rochester Heights community. I actually grew up in Lewisburg, North Carolina, Franklin County, not far from Raleigh. And I have a huge connection with the land. I grew up on land and acreage that my paternal, my father's side of the family has inhabited since uh, this country was but one year old, 1790. Uh, 75 years as enslaved Africans and 156 years uh, since emancipation and the end of the Civil War. And so, from my family standpoint, land is a personified family member. We actually speak about the land as if it were a family member. There is a close tie to the land. Now, I would say that my uh, foray into environmental efforts began when I was in elementary school and there was a proposed um, waste management site uh, in my community. And so community members gathered together and actually stopped uh, this waste management site. But one of the outcomes was a recycling initiative that previously had not um, uh, begun, had, had been a part of. So that then became naturally part of our community. So I've been a priest at St. Ambrose for nine years, which is in the Walnut Creek wetland, um, a place where the city of Raleigh dumped raw sewage for decades, and also a place of continuous flooding. And so St. Ambrose has, I would say, the same affinity to the land, uh, i.e. Walnut Creek and Walnut Creek wetlands that I had an affinity to the land uh, growing up in Franklin County. And so I joined SMAC because I wanted to be an agent uh, to help enact change and give my voice to address policy. I think that policy is important. As a trained engineer, I have uh, both undergrad and graduate degrees in mechanical engineering. Uh, with the concentration in robotics and vehicle design. And so I combined uh, both, both my engineering and theological training, particularly around this topic of environmental racism, how human beings can, from a theological standpoint, repent for their sins against God's created order through policy and agency. And so for me, it all boils down how we treat our closest neighbor, which is the environment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jamond, uh, for those great insights into uh, your background and, and what you bring to the commission. It invokes to me uh, words of Aldo Leopold and his, his guidance that we should view the land as a community to which we belong and not an asset which belongs to us. Do we have... Um, Mr. Stancil, any uh, planning commission updates that you wish to share? Uh, hey, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Uh, I've recently been made aware of a rezoning case in the Falls Lake water supply watershed, and we will be closely monitoring this. Uh, the zoning case is Z2121. Uh, it's my understanding that it's on the planning commission agenda for next week and sometime thereafter might go to council. Uh, if any commission members have any questions about this case or anything else, please feel free to reach out to myself or Wayne Miles about it and we'll do what we can to uh, get you some information. Thank you. Um, is there any uh, background that would be 
pertinent to share right now in terms of the the basic nature of rezoning or any um just the location I, I think the being located uh in the same watershed as where we get our drinking water from in the city of raleigh it's just a uh just that's the probably the biggest thing we want to uh keep keep in you know stay up to date on with and if i mr chair just a, a quick comment there um, this is a property that has been proposed to be rezoned in, in the past and, and, and was not. Uh, the proposal is to go from an R1 zoning, which is the current zoning, which is uh, a single family uh, unit per acre, um, to a multifamily zoning for the purposes of, of apartment, uh, apartment complex. So um, th there, th this is a high profile case from a a stormwater perspective potentially. So I appreciate Mr. Stansel bringing this to everyone's attention. And um, it, it is one that could get a lot of questions. So we wanted to make sure the commission was aware of it. If you do get any questions about it, as Mr. Stansel said, he and I'd be glad to help address any, any questions that you um, may be hearing. Okay. And so this is, uh, is this within Raleigh's ETJ or actual corporate limits? It's, uh, it's at the intersection of Six Forks and Strickland Road, uh, south of 540. So it's definitely in the Raleigh city limits. And, and there is water and sewer service okay. already available at that site. That is often a question that comes up when um, water supply watershed rezoning cases or development um, is, is proposed. Um, and, and I guess, Mr. Um, just a, a, a slight clarification, um, the site is completely surrounded by the city limits, but at this point in case that one particular parcel has not been annexed in, into the city. So it falls into the category of what we sometimes call a, a donut hole within the city limits. Mm -hmm. but, but Mr. Stansel's right. It's, it's, there are city limits completely surrounding the site. Um, you know, the, the, SMAC and Planning Commission liaison is a uh, a new role that has been established just several months ago. So this would be, I think, the first time that we're bringing bringing up a, a rezoning case uh, in a SMAC meeting in, in that context. Um, with the timeline for this going to Planning Commission, I think you said next week, um, is there anything more that we as the uh, stormwater commission would it would be appropriate for us to be uh, looking about looking at and talking about at this point and I'll, I'll make that question to you Wayne um, but to any other commissioners that you know, feel a desire to speak up on this yeah and I'll, and I'll start with a comment officially um, the commission has no role per se, in the rezoning process. Um, so I think the intent of this liaison um, role was really to help share information and make everyone aware so that if concerns are heard or voiced, there would be a communication channel uh, to, to help with that discussion. Um, so certainly any questions that commissioners have um, or questions that you hear from your constituents or council members, perhaps even, um, we're, we're glad to help address those and um, really wanted to bring this up primarily from an informational standpoint because of the potential stormwater and water quality rule implications to the rezoning. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Um, any other commissioners have questions or comments on this at this time?
Okay. Um, well, I for one will dive in and read the rezoning case later and uh, make sure I'm well informed about it. Uh, at this point, I'll hand it on to you, Wayne, uh, for the staff updates and other updates. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And one, I guess, just one closing comment on that. If if um, those of you who may not be familiar, there is a rezoning portal on the city's website that has lots of information about all of the rezoning cases, and, and this one's in there. So um, if, if, if you're interested, there's there's a lot of background information on this case and really any rezoning case that's, that's pending um, before the Planning Commission and, and the Council. So feel free to um, explore that, and if you have any questions, we'd be glad to help help folks access that information. Um, moving on, um, we have no um, staff updates this month, although there are several pending, so uh, next month we, we will. Um, moving to the high priority topics, um, I wanted to um, point out and note to the commission um, a, an, a severe flooding event that, that occurred uh, within the past month, and there was background information in your um, um, materials for this meeting that gave a lot more details that I would urge you to um, re review as you are interested. Um, and, and this is the same um, material that was um, provided to the city council just for their for their update as, as well. But early in the morning hours of Saturday, October 9th, um, there was a significant storm that moved through West Raleigh and Cary. It had been forecast to be one to three inches. Um, as it ended up, it dropped um, up to um, over slightly over five and a half inches, and, and all of that was in a very short period of time. So in, in several locations, the rainfall intensity actually exceeded that of a 500 year event or a 0.02% um, chance probability uh, event. So a very significant rainfall event. Um, the implications of that or the result of that were the um, uh, apartment complex along a Dana Drive um, called uh, the Brook Hill Townhouse Apartments had several buildings that, that flooded um, up to about two or three feet. So some fa fairly substantial flooding, um, quite a few residents were impacted. The um, Raleigh Fire Department um, water rescue team was mobilized and they did remove um, a number of employee uh, uh, residents, assist them in leaving their homes. Um, quite a few cars were impacted. Um, I, I, um, I actually somewhat co coincidentally was slated to um, teach a class at the Walnut Creek Watershed um, Center that, that morning, was able to, to drive by Dana Drive, just past the peak of the flooding, and make some observations and take some pictures that I, that I shared with the class, which was a, um, a, a class that we are partnering with, Partners for Environmental Justice, to educate the community on floodplain issues. So there was obviously a lot of interest in the class, um, I observed probably up to um, close to 100 cars that had been flooded up over the wheel wells, um, and you could you could see some substantial impacts there. So this is an event that we are uh, diagnosing very closely. We've hired a surveyor to survey high water marks. Um, we have our, as we presented to you recently, our gauge adjusted radar rainfall data that gives us much more detailed information about the specifics of the rainfall, where it occurred, the intensity. That's how we, we, we do have this information of, of, about the uh, return period of, of the storm. And, um, and we are taking a close look at this. Now, I will say um, this apartment complex has been known to flood in the past. It's a well-documented um, location of flooding. The apartments were built in the 1960s. So this was prior to the city having floodplain maps or, or any floodplain regulations regulating development in the floodplain. And it is actually several buildings are located in the floodway, um, which um, FEMA prohibits any any development in, in the floodway 
federally right right now. So under today's um, uh, ordinance, th this would not be developed, and certainly, especially with the um, improvements that the um, city council has recently adopted at SMAC's recommendation, um, this development would would not occur. Um, but regardless, it's it's a serious situation. There are a lot of residents impacted, and because this is a rental community, um, most, if not all, did were not aware they were in flood prone areas, nor were um, did they have insurance. So, um, thus exacerbating the, the impacts of these communities. So we we are working closely with follow up. Um, there are FEMA regulations regarding how much money can be spent to improve. Um, the buildings um, before they would have to be upgraded to current flood standards. So that's something we're looking at very, very closely. Um, and um, we, we did do some inspections um, recently and saw that work was being done without a permit. And so that is a violation. And so we did stop that work um, so that it was not being done, quote, under the radar, um, which would trigger the, the FEMA regulation. And then we are also um, looking at ways that we can improve engagement notification um, in, in, in all situations for residents that are in flood prone areas that may not be aware of that. So um, unfortunate situation, unfortunately, also it's been one that has happened before. Um, our, our goal is to, to have a different outcome this time. Um, and, and we are um, pursuing FEMA, um, uh, pursuing a potential FEMA um, grant for a buyout. Uh, these pro the property owner has been approached multiple times previously about a buyout and rejected the buyout. Um, it is uh, It has to be a voluntary buyout situation under FEMA regulations. So um, that's, a, that's the situation. I'll continue to update the commission. Um, as as this progresses, and if there's any additional questions at this time, I'd be glad to to take those. And as, as I said, there's a a lot more detail in the agenda package that was sent out to you. Wayne, I appreciate you mentioning that you know the city's offered to buy them out multiple times, and they rejected that. So there's not much we can do there. I do have a question. Um, I'm guessing we cannot request that they put. Uh, subject to flooding on their parking lot, but is there a potential for signage on any public roads in that area subject to flooding to warn people in that area that they're getting into a flood prone area and to check on that? Yeah, that, that's a very good point, um, Mark, and, and definitely something that we're looking into. Uh, we do believe we have the capability on public right away to, to put that type of notification. Um, it would be similar to, you know, we have put the flashing um, light sign subject to flooding in, in some locations, and this, this would be a location that we could potentially do that or some other type of signage as, as, as well. We'd have to look, um, we, we do need to look at public roads versus private roads in that vicinity as, as well. This would be something that we'd have to do on public right of way. But, but yes, a good idea and something we are investigating. Thanks, Wayne. It's unfortunate that there is not more um, recourse for the renters who were in this situation um, and and that the property owner would decline that buyout opportunity and essentially create that risk situation for those renters uh, into the future, even though they know past history of the property. Um, I view it as irresponsible, but we are also investigating um, uh, landlord tenant requirements at the state level and um, looking at what types of responsibilities the landlord would have associated with providing habitable living conditions. Um, so that's something that we are investigating as, as well. And we'll, we'll keep you all appraised of, of, of all of those um, directions that we're, we're looking. 
And are these so these apartments currently considered uninhabitable until the floodwater damages have been repaired, or is the current situation is the landlord free to just begin renting again? Yeah, that that would be subject to an inspection by um, the, the building inspectors and. Um, I, I don't know the status of any follow up inspections. Um, I don't know, but Ben, do you happen to know whether any um, building code inspectors have, have visited that site since? It looks like you're muted, Ben, too. Yeah, we have uh, contacted the um, building inspectors and also. Um, Housing and environmental group to check the livability of that. Uh, I know the building inspectors were making them come in to get their permits, uh, same as we were, and I haven't heard back from the housing and neighborhood folks to uh, see about the livability of those apartments. But I can double check that and get back to you. Yeah, we'll we'll report back on that, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Yeah, the only other thing I can think of in this particular situation is to try to make a educational event out of it and somehow approach the media to make them aware of that situation that for renters it's a buyer beware situation that they need to know about that and make that inquiry when they rent an apartment whether or not it's subject to flooding. I know that thing was reported on the news when it first happened, but it'd be an interesting follow up case for probably one of the TV stations and get a lot of uh, education value out of it. Yes, I agree. I think that's a, a, another good point. And, and there was significant coverage by local news media. And I, I, I agree. I think there would be interest in a, in a follow up from an educational standpoint. Good, very good suggestion. We'll, we'll follow up on that. Thanks, Wayne. And if there are no other questions on that, um, moving down, um, the we do have one notice prior to construction. This is a, a, a joint project between stormwater and parks and recreation um, for the Baileywick Park Improvements Project, which includes two uh, non-regulatory bioretention cells uh, that the stormwater um, has, has assisted in uh, partnering with parks and recreation to implement as part of that project. And uh, that would conclude my um, report, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Um, I should have noted this at the beginning of the meeting, but uh, Anne uh, is a new commission member. You probably have lots of questions. I encourage you to ask them. Um, so this is how we, um, it seems like you're coming in with a fair amount of knowledge. Uh, and if you run into things where uh, you feel like you if you lack that knowledge, feel free to speak up and I'll encourage any commission member to do that at any point. That's so um, I'll let you move on. Uh, Wayne, I think you wanted to give an introduction on this next uh, topic regarding the incorporation of GSI in the city's East Civic Tower. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Um, yes, yeah, so this is uh, an important topic and, and I'd like to introduce Priscilla Williams. Uh, Priscilla is the uh, construct, uh, city construction projects administrator. She is effectively my counterpart under um, in the engineering services uh, department. Um, we, we both report to, to Blair Hinkle and Priscilla and her group are responsible for implementing um, construction of large facilities and other facility related infrastructure. For example, fire departments, um, the, the, the recently opened police training center um, were those were their projects um, that they managed. And uh, Priscilla, and, and, and I'll let her introduce her team that's uh, here with her. Um, they are going to talk about the uh, design of the city's East Civic Tower project. Um, and, and the context here for SMAC, as, as you're aware, um, the recently adopted a green stormwater infrastructure plan that uh, the commission developed, um, recommended to council and was endorsed by council 
one of the key tenants is uh, to lead by example. And this project is one of the cities, if not the, the largest um, development project by the city in our, in our history. So high profile project, one that we definitely wanna take the opportunity to lead by example in implementing green stormwater infrastructure and uh, a project that uh, we will be very proud of. And so with that, um, I will turn it over to Priscilla Williams and thank um, her and her team very much for, for coming and uh, presenting to the commission to, today. Oh, I'm sorry, and, and one other just quick comment. Um, I, I do believe this um, uh, council member Knight, who is the SMAC um, liaison to council, had suggested um, that SMAC may be interested in, in hearing a little bit more about this project when he was, became aware of some of the GSI related work being being done on it. So um, as a result, Ms. Williams is here today and thank you Priscilla for coming. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Miles and good afternoon, Chair Evans and members of SMAC. And thank you to council member Knight in his absence for the invitation to share information about the stormwater design features of the East Civic Tower project. As Mr. Miles stated, I am Priscilla Tyree Williams. I'm the project manager, and it is my pleasure to introduce the team, City of Raleigh staff members, Stephanie Sieber, Kelly Ham, and Elizabeth Noe. And we are joined this afternoon by our designer of record ratio and its site civil consultant, Seppi, Ben Horn and Leslie Bartleba from ratio and Jacqueline Andreatico from CEPI. The East Civic Tower is the first phase of development recommendations from the Civic Campus Master Plan that was prepared by SOM and approved by City Council in 2018. Through a qualifications-based selection process, ratio with international design architect Henning Larson was chosen to lead the project. Through another qualifications-based selection process, the CMAR joint venture of Brassfield and Gorey in association with Holt Brothers Construction joined the team. The project is quickly approaching the 50% milestone in the design development. We submitted for ASR administrative site review on October 26th and expect to receive comments in December. Currently, the project timeline anticipates limited construction starting in spring of 2022, and that will consist of abatement and demolition. Preliminary construction schedule anticipates full building construction commence commencing in the spring of 20. 23 and expected to last 24 months. The East Civic Tower is a 420,000 gross square feet, 20 story tower that will house at completion nearly 1,000 city employees from five different locations in the downtown Raleigh area. The tower has been designed such that embedded growth will not be exhausted until 2040. The new tower seeks to address three goals, provide excellent, efficient customer service, offer collaborative workspace for employees, and focus on security, safety, and accessibility. The ground level through the third level will host the most public facing services, a consolidated public service area, the council chamber, press room and training conference space. Levels four through 19 will house departmental spaces and the mechanical penthouse will be on the 20th level. Located on the site of the former Raleigh Police Department headquarters, the East Civic Tower will consume nearly all of the 0 0.92 acre site. While your introduction to the Civic Campus project as a case study looked at the development of the campus in its entirety, in actuality, the redevelopment of the Avery C. Upchurch block 
will be accomplished in a phased approach. We are particularly excited to be the first city project to apply for GSI incentives through the special funding allocated by city council. To that extent, phase one being located on a previously developed parcel increases the impervious area by 0.15 acre or a little less than 7,000 square feet. The programmed building footprint and the streetscape requirements drive that increase. Now I will ask that our design team led by Ratio and its consultant Seppi to present to you the conceptual stormwater design for the East Civic Tower project. Thank you, Priscilla. I'm going to share my screen here. <clears throat> And we will roll to the uh, presentation. So, um, as Priscilla said, I'm Ben Horn with Ratio, and um, I'll scroll through the first couple of slides here pretty quickly. Um, as Priscilla has covered a lot of the, the uh, basic information of the project. So, uh, again, this is the East Civic Tower, and just a brief overview of. Um, our talking points today, and um, many of you are probably familiar with the site, but if you're not, uh, this is the corner of Hargett and McDowell right across from Nash Square, the old police building. Um, and as Priscilla mentioned, uh, we have the impervious, the existing impervious surface. Uh, and then this is just a, a, a basic um, site plan of the project showing um, that we'll we'll dive into it a little bit more, but again, Priscilla's already uh, mentioned our um, <clears throat> our basic project information. Uh, one thing uh, we do have some elevated terraces that provide some green roof opportunities, which we'll go into a little bit more detail um, later on. And then, um, as Priscilla already noted, our schedule. The one the one thing I did want to pull out here is that. Um, We'll be finishing up the design, the 50% design development at the end of December, and then we plan to submit for building permits uh, towards the end of uh, 2020 in October. And so, with that, I will pass it on to Leslie Barnabal to take us through the, the site concept. Thanks, Ben, and thanks, Priscilla. Um, as you can see here, uh, we've got kind of an axon that shows the site on the ground level a little better, and then we'll get into the terraces as well. But uh, the building itself takes up a fair amount of the uh, site and the property. Um, and within that, we have planter beds um, and steps and benches that are built into those planting beds, uh, kind of cascading down the grade as you go west on Hargett. And there's also some planters as well on the east side of McDowell. Um, and you will also note there's a few tree wells here. Um, and uh, if you go to the next slide, I think we kind of get into that a little bit more. Uh, well, this is actually just so you can get a feel for the site, a good uh, uh, rendering uh, that just illustrates how that public space of the site integrates into the streetscape itself and becomes kind of one amenity area. And there's that kind of wedge on the, the left side of the screen that becomes an amphitheater space for people to spend time. Go to the next slide. So um, this is just a quick overview of the stormwater management strategy for reducing volume from uh, the development of this project. And I will uh, kick that over to Jacqueline from CEPI and uh, dig into what that means. And then we'll talk more about the terraces and other opportunities after that. Hi everyone, uh, hopefully you guys can hear me. My name is Jacqueline, I'm with CEPI. And um, in order to mitigate the increase in impervious area, the 0.15 acres, um, we wanted to implement the use of silva cells. And um, there is approximately 237 uh, currently that we would be putting underneath the sidewalk there. Um, and we are looking at other vendors too because some of the cells are a proprietary um, uh, proprietary device. So um, 
We are sending approximately by a little over 5,000 square feet from the roof and the 4th floor terrace uh, directly to the silver cells and that will treat that water and detain um, a good bit of it. And it will be flowing off site um, up to the west of your screen. It will be connecting to an inlet on the adjacent property. And I'll add while we're on this slide, um, let me go back one more. We may consider making these planters um, a uh, maybe infiltrating or treatment planters. So we're still working through some of those uh, concepts right now to understand if that's possible. And uh, I just wanted to keep that in mind as we talk about the other strategies, but we wanted to find ways to continue to integrate green infrastructure throughout this to help not only with water volume, but with water quality. Okay, you can get to the next slide. So this is just gonna quickly show you what the terraces look like um, per level. There's uh, terraces at levels two, three, and four, and they kind of fold back as you go up the building. Uh, the first terrace is, is more narrow. There will be some raised planters uh, within, um, and those can help treat some of the water as well. If you go to the next slide, Terraces three and four also incorporate an extensive green roof, uh, at a fairly large uh, uh, footprint, as well as the raised planters. And then there's occupiable space throughout as well, which definitely provides opportunities for people to uh, uh, like, obviously in, enjoy the space, but also learn about green infrastructure and see it kind of in action. And then the final slide is the fourth terrace, which has the largest square footage. You get to the next slide, sorry. Before we leave this slide, oh, sure. I just wanted to point out that um, levels two and three are um, largely public. So the, mm. the thought is the public will have access to these or be able to go out and enjoy the space. Um, and then as we go up to the fourth floor, the fourth floor is more of a uh, semi private. Yeah, and the fourth floor here, you can see a much larger uh, extensive green roof space to the north and then an occupiable space to the south. And uh, Jacqueline, I believe this um, roof terrace as well as the uh, main roof on top of the tower are both the places where the water is coming through internal downspouts into the silva cells. Correct. So if you go to the next slide, I think that might be about it. Yeah, um, so we just wanted to uh, show how both on the ground level, even with a very little amount of space, we're trying to utilize green infrastructure and innovative techniques, such as possibly using those planters to connect to those or to just provide extra treatment to not only work with the volume that is required um, to capture post development, but also to uh, possibly treat the stormwater and either that or reduce peat flow. So um, we're excited to hear what you think about these strategies. So thank you to the design team and Mr. Miles, we're available for questions that SMAC may have. Excellent, thank you very much, Ms. Williams and, and team, Help, very helpful. I'll, I'll turn it back to the Mr. Mr. Chair, if you'd like to call for questions or, or any other comments or discussion. Yeah, we do have a little time for uh, questions and comments from commissioners, write those now. I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to say it is nice to see this. It looks looks great. This this is Ken. I've got one. Go ahead. Um, so I saw the the profile from this side. How many total stories is this going to be when it's done? It'll be 20. twenty stories. Okay, and so you've chosen the lower, I guess the mid, the lower levels for the um, rain garden locations and the stormwater applications. Is there any reason why you didn't put it higher on the roof also, or are you gonna do that and just didn't talk about that? The roof, the 20th level is where all of our mechanical equipment is gonna be housed. Okay. So that takes up most of that space with AC units and whatnot, I guess. It does. Okay, just curious. 
we we have contemplated a small area on the 20th floor that could be built out as a future terrace. Um, but due to current program um, and budgeting, we are not showing that as a part of uh, the project right now. So I, I just have a question about. Uh, of course, the plant end of things. So I'm a huge fan of green roofs, and I really like seeing that you've incorporated green roofs and the silver cells. Um, my concern is always going to be about management of those spaces, and because they're only going to function as good as the plants are really healthy. So just I've, I've seen so many instances where green roofs are designed, and they really hadn't considered access for management. And so just making sure that before that gets too far into the design uh, process that 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 that's considered. So e easy access of of those gardens would be really critical for the success. Yeah, you're talking you're talking about physical access to them so that they can be maintained. Yeah. There are a couple of pathways that we've been starting to develop, but um, that's a really wonderful point. And we've been working with um, or beginning to work with uh, various green roof consultants to help understand that maintenance need and like if we need to have a little bit more access than we're showing now. But thank you for that. And we're also wanting to work with them to really work on the plant palette, you know, on the extensive green roofs, we might do a lot of sedums, but in some of these plant raised planters and even in some of the extensive green roof areas, depending on their depths, perhaps finding some other plant material that would do well up there, uh, drought tolerant, um, to just make sure that that it doesn't right. require too much extra care. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's actually one of like the big sticking points is of course people's default is to think about sedums because mm -hmm. they are really fabulous in hot dry locations, but we also get 50 inches of rain here. So actually moving forward is like a diversity of plants are optimal because they you want plants that will transpire at different rates. So plants mm -hmm. that can thrive in those dry periods and plants that can help move water out of uh, the filter, uh, the, the, the planting media. So like, you can't go wrong with diversity of plants and that will also help with like pollinators or whatever else uh, you want to plant up in that area. Absolutely. And, and even in the, if we do use those um, planters at ground level for bioretention, I happen to have your book in and we can use that. You, you know, know where it works. I'm, I'm happy to help. So. Thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, just, just for clarity, uh, there's about a 7,000 square foot increase in impervious surface and the components, the GSI components here are being designed around uh, treating about 5,000 square feet of impervious. Um, I believe we're trying to treat the, the 0.15 acres, which is about 6,400 some change square feet. Okay, so pretty close to the full increase in impervious. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I wasn't, you know, throwing those numbers out to make a point, just trying to get clarity. Right. Um, I guess one of the, uh, and this question is for anybody on the team or Wayne, um, one of the key parts of the the city's GSI plan or for plan for increase in the use of GSI was the process of, um, you know, cost comparison, engineering comparison, and sort of life, lifespan projections uh, in the planning process. And if, I don't know if there's anybody who wants to comment on that because this seems like well, this is the, you know, first instance of um, going through that process uh, and, and following through on it. Uh, on a real project um, and maybe could signal some lessons learned uh, for future city construction projects. Maybe it's not the first, but it's a good opportunity, I think, to to look at that. Yeah, absolutely, Mr. Chair. I, and, I, and I'll start off with that and, and, and then ask Kevin Boyer to, to, to chime in as well. Um, so, yes, this is, this is really the, er, an early test of the GSI plan and the intent of how we would incorporate GSI into, into city projects. So, this is, a, this is a pilot and, and, and boy, what a pilot to start with. 
Uh, but Kevin Boyer and our, um, our, our new GSI advocate, Sally Hoyt, um, have also been uh, closely involved in this review process. And, um, and as you may recall, we intentionally had our GSI advocate position part of our plan review group so that they could be involved in those discussions, both from an advocacy standpoint as well as from a compliance standpoint. And, and our goal here, um, and, and as you recall from the funding that you all um, helped suggest that we um, um, put in our budget for GSI, that funding is um, only for above and beyond GSI, beyond what is needed from a regulatory compliance standpoint. So part of the conversation with this design team is, um, okay, here's how the GSI, the silver cells are being used to meet regulatory requirements to control the new impervious area, but then let's look at what else above and beyond we can do, either additional silver cells and or the green roofs, which are not regulatory requirements, um, but additions that we can then fund with our, with our GSI um, fund. And, um, and with that, I guess, Kevin, you know, we're working through what this process really looks like because this is an early test of it. But, um, Kevin, would you mind adding in any, any comments that you and Sally may have? I'd, I'd be happy to start. And, uh, Mr. Kane, your, your recollection is spot on. Uh, the, the plan that City Council approved uh, uh, right up front, action number one, uh, was to uh, continue to develop and vet that uh, city GSI policy that would guide how uh, city um, project managers and departments would consider and go about deciding whether and to what extent to incorporate GSI on projects that disturb the land. Uh, the project still, uh, that policy still is, uh, is being vetted uh, and is not, not in place. And uh, so it's not you know, a, a formal expectation yet, or even informal uh, that it be implemented. And it's also meant to be implemented at the very, very early uh, stages of a project. And, and this, this, this project is, is pretty far along. Uh, but I will say that uh, two aspects of the intent of the, the policy is to, um, for, for where stormwater treatment is required to use GSI to the extent practicable, which the silver cell application is, is uh, proposed to, to do that. And then uh, to, but to also evaluate going above and beyond requirements. And that's where the, the green roof components uh, come in. So not strictly speaking, uh, sticking to the policy, but certainly sticking to the, to the intent and spirit of uh, where we believe the policy will go. As I said, so still needs to go through a vetting and, and uh, administrative ad adoption uh, process in the city. As far as the, uh, the stormwater uh, capital improvements uh, budget providing funding for above and beyond a GSI, we are in discussions with, with uh, Priscilla's group um, about that and, and we'll are and will continue to entertain their proposals for uh, how such funding uh, might be used. Uh, the silver cells, because they're being proposed for compliance purposes, would not be eligible for that funding, uh, but the, the, the um, suggested green roof components would. Sally, do you have anything to, to, to add on top of that? Um, I guess I would I would follow up and say that um, because of the constraints on this site, we probably did not, uh, there was not as much analysis of alternatives as, as there might be on a larger site uh, because it, it seems that the team is basically maxing out what the possibilities are. So um, where that process might be different on, on a project like the Dix Plaza and Play, which is another of the first projects to come through this process.
Thank you. And uh, thanks to Ms. Williams and your team for uh, engaging in this early test case. Thank you very much. Um, we look forward to a, a great project and I know that this project has gotten so much attention and is frequently used for um, case studies, just like Kevin and his team have done um, to advance GSI. So it's our hope that um, as we look at this, po this new policy and process that we will um, definitely be one of the success stories uh, about how well um, this project satisfied the intent and the spirit of the city's new policy. So, um, Mr. Miles, uh, without any other questions, I'm guessing we can be excused. <laughs> yes, yes, you may. Thank you very much to you and your team for, for coming and joining us. Very helpful and uh, informative presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for arranging that, uh, Wayne, and um, for all the city staff that have worked on that project. We are a little bit uh, ahead of schedule here, but uh, I think we be good to take this opportunity to uh, move on to our next agenda topic, which uh, I'm excited about uh, digging into uh, the hair snipe, sorry, hair snipe watershed study and uh, analysis of the equity opportunities there. Um, and I'll point commissioners to the you know, pages in your agenda packet, the presentation that's I, I think going to be provided here. Um, and encourage you to review those and uh, engage in this uh, enthusiastically. Yes, Mr. Chair, if, and if I may, I'll um, be glad to give an introduction uh, to this topic as well. And there is a presentation, so um, while we're while we're bringing that up, I'll, I'll go ahead and. And, and start with some, some context. So, as uh, the commission um, may recall, um, one of the key additions to our work plan for next fiscal year was to look at equity and inclusion issues and diversity related issues um, and how they can and should be incorporated into stormwater policies and planning and community en engagement. Um, and so um, this watershed planning study um, is the first of our new era of, of watershed studies. And we thought that this project would be a good opportunity to include and establish what we're calling an, an equity framework to our planning and CIP development and prioritization process. And so we've engaged with um, Brown and Caldwell who is uh, doing the, the, the watershed study to, to help develop this equity framework as part of that project. And, um, you know, several of the items today, we, um, we, we wanna give an overall perspective on the division's progress and equity initiatives. Um, there is a document that has been brought, provided in your backup materials that um, we, we welcome any feedback that. Uh, the commission has on, on the ideas. And we will today um, provide some opportunity for feedback and then um, foreshadowing, there will be a part two uh, to this equity discussion in December at your meeting. So there will be additional time and opportunities for you to provide feedback. Um, so, so if you want to think about it more in the next month, and have additional ideas, um, we would welcome that feedback as, as well. Um, in, in addition, um, and we appreciate Brown and Caldwell's work on, on this, in addition to this um, work, 
um, which we've been working very closely with the um, Department of Equity Inclusion in the city. They have a number of initiatives that are moving forward as, as well in this important policy area. And internally, um, within the division, um, we have an employee committee, and that employee committee has appointed a subcommittee that is looking specifically at internal equity and inclusion issues as well. And um, another item, we have uh, an employee survey that we do every year. And this year was the first year that we included um, questions to our employees. And those survey results are completely anonymous. So we wanted to gauge um, our employees' internal thoughts on how we're doing related to equity, inclusion, diversity, hiring practices, um, as well as their impression of how we are doing externally in, um, in, in uh, integrating equity and inclusion into our community policies and decisions. So we've gotten some very good feedback through that process as, as well. But um, I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Barbara Maranta, Barbara's been our project manager for this project, and let her um, take it from here and then introduce the consulting team who's been helping us with this with this project. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Wayne. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of SMAC. As Wayne mentioned, we are excited about this equity framework and are thankful for the opportunity to share it with you and get your feedback. And the goal of this project was to incorporate equity considerations into all phases of the planning effort, such as equitable engagement, project prioritization. And I'm pleased to introduce the Brown and Caldwell team who helped us with this effort. Uh, Stephanie Hansis, Rosie Jinks, and Victoria Blackwell, they will be going through the next um, 10 slides. And Stephanie will be providing an overview of the Harris Knight watershed study. Rosie will review the approach to defining equity and incorporating equitable practices into the study. And Victoria will review the equity framework and also bring up the polling questions. So we would really like the commission's feedback on the, on the recommended actions for incorporating equity. And so we're doing some polling at the end of the presentation. And we have three questions where we're asking SMAC to rank the recommendations according to which approach most resonates with you. And this will be um, an anonymous polling um, so we can get everyone's feedback. And we do have a fourth question at the end uh, where you can just write in or provide feedback for anything that you did not see in the framework or, or wish us to discuss or address. And of course, at the end, we have time for questions and comments. So I will now turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, and thank you, Commission, for the opportunity to speak with you all today about the work we've been doing. Um, so as William and Barbara um, noted, we're here today to discuss um, the equity framework we've developed with city staff, and that includes uh, incorporating other offices and department staff input into this process. Uh, as a part of the Harris Knight Watershed Study, um, we have a few slides today to preview the work that was completed, and then we'll have that polling available to you. Um, I believe you all should be getting a link from um, Colin in the chat. Um, that should be able to open up that polling when it goes live um, so you can participate. Um, so the goal of the polling is really to get your feedback and, and affirm the goals that we have identified with city staff and really um, look at if there's any other additional um, goals that you want um, the city to consider for the Harris Snipe watershed and potentially for future watersheds um, since this framework is intended to inform both processes. So also, please feel free to ask any questions along the way. We certainly don't mind uh, being interrupted. We'd love to have a open dialogue as we go. Next slide, please. So the Harris Knight Creek Watershed Study is the first study in the new generation of watershed studies that the city's undertaking, as Wayne mentioned. Um, so really the goals of watershed studies are to improve our data and understanding of uh, local areas. And this really helps us identify needs and projects, which ultimately informs how um, public funds are spent. 
Um, this process is also intended to be a community engagement practice. Um, additionally, our project is working with the integrated planning framework to incorporate both flood mitigation and water quality modeling and solutions throughout the Harrison Creek watershed. Finally, uh, as part of this project, we're documenting all of our methodologies so that they can be consistently applied um, for across all watershed studies um, that the city undertakes. Next slide, please. So a quick orientation to the Hare Snipe Creek study area. Um, the Hare Snipe Creek watershed is primarily bound by Glenwood Avenue um, to the east, Creek and or sorry, <laughs> Glenwood Avenue to the west and Creedmoor Road to the east. Um, so the creek flows into Crabtree Creek, uh, just upstream of the Crabtree Valley Mall. Um, this creek was selected as the first study area um, due to a number of projects within the city's backlog, um, some planned capital improvement projects, uh, water quality concerns within the watershed, and the length of time since the last study was completed. Our project tasks are pretty wide ranging. Um, and they include everything from flow monitoring, which we have recently completed, public outreach support, all the way down through stream assessments and piloting some technologies, uh, both water quantity and water quality modeling. Then we'll be using that data to um, inform project identification, alternatives development, and prioritization. But all of these tasks are um, being um, led by um, our first task, which was the watershed planning equity framework document. So now I'd like to turn it over to Rosie to discuss a few of the city's um, other equity efforts that have informed our work. Hi everyone, nice to see you today. Thanks, Stephanie. So from the beginning, this team really emphasized the importance of aligning this work with the other citywide efforts being led by the Department of Equity and Inclusion. We met with them uh, several times to share the thinking and to align efforts. Um, and so where possible, this equity framework can inform and pilot some of the ideas that we're talking about today uh, with the understanding that it's, we're not going to get too far ahead of the city's related initiatives. And that there should be several touch points uh, to make sure that they continue to be aligned. Um, uh, the city's working on organizational building, organizational capacity around equity, workforce development and equity. Uh, engagement in planning and inclusive, uh, inclusive engagement in planning um, for development and growth and climate resilience. Next slide, please. To get us started, we wanted to see how the city was considering equity and started with local definitions. Um, so the city of Raleigh's Department of Equity and Inclusion um, considers equity to be justice, fair treatment, and the opportunity for the advancement of all people across all systems including housing, education, economics, healthcare, environmental, social, and community. Um, and we also looked at the Community Climate Action Plan, which has an emphasis on equity uh, that defines equity that ensures that all people have access to the opportunities and resources necessary to meet their essential needs, support their well being, and achieve their full potential. It's achieved when race, gender, age, national origin, disability, language access, creed, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, or economic status do not determine or predict the distribution of resources, opportunities, benefits, and burdens for an individual group. Next slide, please. So we work, uh, when we do sort of equity work around watershed plans or uh, utility planning, we think about it through these three lenses, these categories, um, and the first being procedural equity. Um, and pro that's when processes, especially governmental processes, are fair and inclusive in the development or the implementation of any policy program or project. Um, and it's really where all people have a voice in the decisions that impact their lives. Uh, and an example of having procedural equity is providing outreach flyers that reflect the language present in the community you're serving. Um, and I'd say that most government entities are most comfortable and familiar with procedural equity. Uh, and so the next two uh, types of equity, I think, are really where we start to get into bringing equity into decision making and, and uh, et cetera, that, that's more, uh, you know, sort of newer to communities to be thinking about. So distributional equity ensures that resources, benefits and burdens associated with the policy program or project are distributed fairly and that the people with the greatest needs receive highest priority. And given past inequities, 
This can require a higher level of investment in communities that are previously underserved or overburdened. Um, and a common example may be to ra raise the priority for improvements in a low end community, but essentially it's really about the, that the burdens and benefits of any investment are fairly distributed. Uh, and lastly, we talk about intergenerational or structural equity that works to re re correct past long lasting disadvantages and seeks to prevent future negative consequences through accountability and decision making structures that lead into sustained positive outcomes. So, and, and, and that's really where you're looking at your, your system for how you can start to remedy past injustices. Um, and an example there may be investment in education or training or hiring uh, from pools of people that are currently underrepresented to re-ensure that the organizations reflect the demographic of the community served. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I think this is where I'm gonna turn it over to Vic now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, and for some reason at this time, my camera is malfunctioning, so I apologize for that. Um, but my job uh, this afternoon is to walk you through what's been our process in developing the equity framework. Um, and so what you see is kind of the four steps that got us there. Um, and first was to really get ourselves rooted in what was happening across the city uh, as it relates to embedding ethical practices and inclusive procedures, um, both in decision making and you know how services are being rendered within the community. And this was done through, you know, three listening sessions that we, we held during the summer of this year um, with the goal to identify initiatives and partnerships within the city that would align with the work the stormwater was doing through the Harris Night Creek watershed study and, you know, the, the studies like it that would, will, will soon follow. Um, and what the listening sessions helped us do was to hear feedback from across the city, across departments, across offices on, on opportunities to center equity by updating current approaches to, uh, to programs. And we learned very happily that, you know, equity initiatives and work along the lines of the equity framework are ongoing and important throughout, throughout the city. Following that, we held what we, we termed as kind of a state of the practice workshop um, that really looked to serve and put some concrete ideas behind those equity aspects that Rosie was mentioning. Um, so it was a review of local initiatives and what was happening, what is happening in other governmental organizations nationwide to see how, how are procedural distributional and intergenerational equity really being practiced, you know, within those organizations, how they get started, um, what does it look like ongoing? How do you iterate these processes to make them impactful for the community um, that they're being deployed in? And one thing we did note, it, as Rosie mentioned, is starting with procedural equity, um, you know, the aspect where you consider who has voice in the decision making is the typical starting point. Um, and from, from this workshop, goals and actions started to really rise to the top that resonated um, for the stormwater division based on what seemed like it would be appropriate and impactful for, for the local communities. And just to give you a, a highlight of some of those things, we, 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 you know, we reviewed some local work, including that of the Department of um, Equity and Inclusion with the City of Raleigh's Equity and Inclusion Action Plan. Uh, we looked at work with the U.S. Water Alliance's equitable approaches to urban flooding, um, we looked at communities who were doing citizen advisory committees um, for oversight on work that's happening within the neighborhood. Um, also, initiatives in parts of the country where they're defining what is the, le the equity level of service. How do you identify kind of what are the characteristics of your vulnerable communities and how you approach servicing or providing services within those communities. So that's really how that state of the practice um, was, was handled. And the last piece before we really started, you know, writing out the bones and the meat of, of the framework was 
another workshop um, where we were looking to develop a list of goals and specific actions for the stormwater division to enact through Prescott Creek Watershed Study and those that follow. And these, these ideas did, they came from the listening sessions, they came from those industry best practices and emerging trends um, with the goal um, to really put those things on paper and be able to write them such that they something you can track, that you can, you know, do move forward in project work and create some partnerships across city departments and offices. Um, and one thing that we noticed is that all of the goals and the actions in the framework aren't immediately actionable in the context of the current watershed study. We acknowledge that some of them will need further support and you know resources throughout the division, but they were you know very important and highly got a high level of consensus among among the the stormwater division as we were going through that process. And then came the uh, framework itself. Um, and really, what this slide kind of seeks to summarize what what you what we want to see in the framework. So what, you, what we came up with are seven umbrella goals and, a, and 19 discrete actions that are each separated into those equity aspects, the procedural distribution of the generational. Um, and so this list in front of you really speaks to and summarizes the way that the equity framework is designed to be used and what it seeks to achieve through its application. And so in, in a few slides, we'll come back to and look at these um, equity actions in more detail. Barbara and Stephanie have both said to get your affirmation on them to help you add an additional layer of prioritization um, to guide how, how they move forward. Um, the equity framework was, or is the, the first kind of big endeavor, the first piece task of, of the study. And so now that we we have this, this version of it ready, it's we're using it, you know, and it'll be used even more as we progress through the next task of the project. Um, and community engagement is the primate, one of the first biggest components. Um, to make sure that the people who are impacted by this project are helping us define um, what the problem is and the opportunities, what the opportunities are within the watershed. So this is just a snapshot of the current um, community engagement survey that's been deployed within the Hairstack Creek watershed um, to, to go about starting that process. And I'm gonna pass it to Rosie and she's gonna kind of walk us through how the process continues from, from this point. Thanks, Vic. So this is a flow chart that we developed that kind of interweaves equity into all the major stages of a typical watershed study or watershed planning process. Um, and equitable engagement is the engagement stats, the sorry, steps are in yellow. Um, and uh, really the, the thought is that equitable engagement brings the community voice into your team's thinking, um, that community engagement can also be used in vetting your assumptions about what you consider to be a problem or an opportunity, um, and to bring in uh, community and the develop it, development and validation of evaluation and selection criteria. Um, as well as helping locate solutions and co-creating, uh, co locating and co-creating opportunities and solutions and prioritizing them. Um, so it's really, there's not a big variance to the typical steps. It's really just about what kind of questions you're asking at each stage of the process. Um, and so we're really excited to see how this team takes it on and, and pilots it um, and really, and, and, and really enjoyed getting to work together. With all of you and really excited by your ambition and enthusiasm for this process. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to turn it back to, to Vic to wrap us up. Yeah. And hello. I figured out what hello. she was. <laughs> um, thank you for, I know sometimes it's hard to just like listen to a voice 
just talking. I appreciate your patience. Um, so uh, in the next uh, four slides, we're going to go through some polling. And so at this time, uh, if you, I'd like to refer you to pages four and five of the equity framework. For the sake of presenting, we had to kind of condense some of the actions um, to fit onto the polling screen, but you have the unabridged version on those pages of the framework. Um, so what we'll do is, as I proceed to the next slide, <clears throat> it'll ask you to rank, rank the ones that you see on the screen. Um, and through this polling, we'll be able to get kind of a live picture of where there's high resonance and like where, where this group um, is kind of placing things in prioritization. Um, and so I am going to verify that you all have the link. It'll be active once I have to actually activate it. So this is starting with the procedural equity actions. And that should be live for you all to start your ranking. And can someone give me a thumbs up and let me know if that's how you're experiencing it? And for those following along at home on the agenda packet, uh, Ms. Blackwell mentioned pages four and five of the, uh, the report, and that is pages, I think, 37 and 38 of your agenda, if you want to see the full, the, the more complete. Uh, list of items. Thank you for making that clarification. Sure. Okay. So we have a poll. Yeah, please let us know. Um, you should have all received a, a link to the poll um, with, under polled.com in the chat. I do see that in mine. I hope everybody else uh, sees that. And, and then uh, on the first on that first introductory screen, you can just click skip and it'll keep everything, um, you know, an anonymous. And then you guys can come in and start ranking. Thank you. I know why these are finalizing. I also want to let you know that we will be able to capture this final, the final layout, um, how each of the actions hold and make that available. So we have a um, have a chance to discuss further at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next one. Unless there's someone who has we have some thoughts at this point.
gonna go ahead and move to the next. All right, I'm going to head to the next one. <clears throat> so the next one is uh, an opportunity to freehand um, what you think may be missing or any other equitable actions that you think are important to have here. And of note in the next poll is the option to kind of upvote your fellow commissioners responses. So if you see one that you're like, oh, yes, that also resonates with me instead of, you know, trying to Type it out very, you know, rapidly. You can, you have the option to upload those that will already be present. Okay. And make sure everyone who wanted to has an opportunity to provide their action. But the, the next portion of our time together is discussion. So at this point, um, Barbara, I don't know if you have any additional words to close us out of this portion to take us into discussion, but or is is open. 
Yeah, thank you, Vic. I wanted to thank everybody for your feedback. Um, our, our plan internally is to review um, the priorities that you have selected and come up with an action plan um, that we can come back to you with um, in December with some ideas on how we can move forward. Um, but would like to open it up at this time if anybody has any further questions or comments or um, things you'd like to discuss. Thank you. I'll invite any of the commissioners uh, to speak up with any questions or comments at this time. Okay. Uh, well, if you, if you, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, uh, in the lack of absence of other comments and questions, I'll, I'll just note, um, uh, Jamon and I were speaking earlier, earlier this week and um, we, we headed down a pathway that led us to something that I, I can identify here in the, um, the report under distributional equity, uh, item number two, identifying synergies between watershed management and other city goals. I think this falls under that heading um, what we were talking about was the city's housing rehabilitation program and whether there is communication between stormwater, uh, the stormwater program and the housing rehabilitation program and whether the left hand and right hand are, um, you know, aligned with each other. Um, so I'm encouraged to see that uh, general heading in there under distributional equity and uh, also Feel like I've I've learned a little something about you know a, a thought that occurred to me to us in the course of a conversation and how it actually fits into a, a language around equity and a and a framework for equity. So thank you for that. Evan, I have a comment. Um, if my two month old son rings out crying, so be it. I was trying to calm him <laughs> down. But um, as I was looking at the um, structural and intergenerational equity example. Um, you know, when you look at demographics, you know, one of the concerns, I know we are just coming out of a census year, but, you know, sometimes census data are not always current. And um, one of the things worked with another group is we were looking at, you know, long-term residents. You know, one concern is that um, as a community is gentrifying that um, new neighbors come in um, that do not reflect at least the historic neighbors um, and so having some type of benchmark either connected to AMI or the number of years resident 10 plus years to really capture those long term uh, residents. Um, and so when I was looking at your slide on interge intergenerational equity, um, dem demographics, you know, when to market and then um, when you, I think it was distributive priority. I think some type of weighting um, would be appropriate. I know Evan and I um, have been talking about um, stormwater projects and what would it look like to have some type of equity ranking or weighting um, such that it would take into consideration maybe some um, historic injustices or social and economic status. Mm -hmm. These are all excellent comments and we we've also been thinking along those same lines um, and we do on this issue look forward to working closely with the department of equity and inclusion so that we're consistent with city policy um, but it will be one of our um, action items moving forward thank you i think um I think I also see this here, and maybe you can uh, affirm for me under the, the heading of distributional equity, um, just as a, you know, a company that's seeking to uh, truly be an equal opportunity employer, um, can't simply look at its hiring practices, but has to look at uh, its recruitment practices and the, the pool of talent that's being built so that they get uh, applicants that are truly reflective of uh, 
the community that they operate in. Um, I've been interested in seeing that, you know, that drainage complaints come in equitably across the community, that, um, that we don't have situations of communities who feel like historically they haven't been served, so what's the point in making that complaint in the first place? Um, so I think that falls under distributional equity there, um, like you know, reviewing the practice of looking at flooding complaints and, and other things. Is that the kind of thing you're um, trying to identify here, one of them? Correct. Yes, absolutely. Um, we want to make sure that we're addressing the problems that we see across the system and it's not that this the squeaky wheel gets the grease, but um, we and we're not um, basing our priorities on, on strictly, you know, on where we hear the complaints. So, yes, that, that will be one of the things that we're looking at. Thank you. This has been a very, um, very different topic for us to take on as SMAC. We <clears throat> tend to get very excited about um, engineering uh, projects and, and things like that. Um, I'll just encourage any other SMAC members who want to weigh in with a question or comment to to do so. I think you made a, a good point there, Evan, that you know a number of us are engineering or engineering oriented, and this is a very different topic for us to get our hands around. You know, my brain is struggling with you know the, the facts and figures and you know, how we determine what projects get funded is, you know, is based on a fairly rigid prioritization system that currently doesn't include anything in the regards to equity. You know, the assumption is that the money goes to the, the most needy project, not opposed necessarily the uh, most worthy from an equity standpoint or to address past wrongs or other things. So it's going to be a, a challenge for us to figure out how to incorporate that and I think you know the first step is looking at what the city's equity goals are and how those can be applied to what we do and how we um, allocate projects and funding. You know, you made a great point that um, one of the issues is that parts of the community may have no idea that they're eligible for uh, assistance from the city. You know, so there's an education component out there, and then there may be a component where. You know, people are reluctant to even apply because they they feel like they don't stand a chance kind of thing, and that needs to be addressed as well. Um, so I think we have our work cut out for us on this one. Hey, you made a good point. I mean, for us, it, it was also a, a learning experience. We learned a lot. We we realized that this is not an an easy answer we can calculate. It's more of a journey, and <laughs> we're gonna. Put a, you know, some thought into to how to get it done, but it is going to be something that we're going to have to also work with our Department of Equity Inclusion and others who are looking at these same issues. So, we, we hope as a group, we can make progress on these. And we look forward to continuing to partner with you all and get your feedback as we go. I'll make another observation here. Um, there's. To, to folks in the watershed world, I think there's a, the well-known Aldo Leopold quote that uh, a river is the report card of its watershed. And perhaps he meant it more broadly, but to me as a, as a water scientist, I've always interpreted that as uh, the health of the water in the watershed, a report card on the water, the condition of the waterways, um, and the human activities as they impact the water. But as I'm thinking about this, um, you know, we have watershed prioritization built into our prioritization model around those types of variables, you know, and uh, 303D listings and uh, things like that. But uh, and think about, you know, the, the stream, if you go out and do a stream cleanup, uh, one thing you'll learn is, well, this stream obviously has a community that is uh, 
has abundant fast food restaurants in it versus uh, streams in other locations. Uh, you may not see, you may see different types of trash. Um, and the, the types of trash that you encounter in a stream cleanup, I think uh, probably reflect other aspects of how that community is, is served and treated. So um, I'm, it's causing me to think a little differently about that and, and to think that the, you know, the watershed framework is, is still a great um, framework for addressing not just water quality issues, but equity issues as well. Any other questions or comments? I thought the presentation was, was fantastic and I'm very excited about this engineering challenge. Excited about um, doing some, some matrices that perhaps have uh, AMI, uh, years of residence, um, uh, past injustices to see what falls out. Um, yeah, so we're certainly going down a, a new path, and I'm glad we're journeying down this path. Thank you all for your feedback and for your time today. And I'm, yes. I'm glad to hear we're going to continue this in December. Uh, I think there's a lot here, and uh, we'll uh, we still have some learning to do, and. Uh, Keep engaging on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Barbara, and the and the consultant team. We appreciate it. This is a very important topic to us. We appreciate all the input from uh, the commissioners as as well. This is something that uh, is going to be an important part of our process of how we set policy for prioritizing um, our projects, and uh, it, it is a different look. Um, from how we've used in the what we've used in the past, and uh, I, and I think something that is very important to make sure that we're serving our community moving forward. So appreciate any feedback. Anyone has any questions over the next month? Feel free to reach out. And uh, as we said, we'll 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 continue this discussion at next month's meeting as well. Um, uh, Barbara or the consultants, any particular homework or? issues we would like the commissioners to think about between now and the next meeting? Well, if, it, if, if we're able to do this, we could send out the polling results so that um, everybody has that in front of them and to think about over um, before the next meeting. I think that would be good. Absolutely. We'll, we'll include those um, in, in the in the minutes, at least, that are sent out a week beforehand, if anyone would like to see those beforehand, um, let, let us know. We, we can go ahead and send those out early if that would be more helpful to you. Hi. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that sure. ahead of time. Thanks. Bye, too. That's all we have, Mr. Chair. Thank you very okay. much. Has anyone, there hasn't been any um, requests for comment or anything like that from the public? I have not seen any additional chat requests or comment requests come in from the public. Let me check my email quickly. I, I do not, I do not okay. see any other requests to, uh, to comment, Mr. Chair. All right. Any other business? Any other commission members want to bring forward at this point? Seems like it may be time to entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Make the motion we adjourn. Right. Second. Okay.
Thank you. And uh, I guess the motion, uh, all in favor of adjournment? <clears throat> Aye. Aye. Okay. Looks like that passes. Thank you, everybody, and uh, enjoy your Thursday evening.